Hey guys, it's History Behind the Warrior, and welcome to yet another God of War video. In today's video, after us having focused our attention on the possibility of exploring the Egyptian pantheon, we will be turning our sights back to the Norse series of games, and specifically be focusing our gaze on the realm of Helheim, the Nordic equivalent of Hell and the Underworld. The realm plays a very, very important part in Norse mythology, also being a key aspect of the God of War world, as it leads to our heroes battling the likes of the Hellwalkers, as well as a gatekeeper. But what other secrets do lie beneath the surface of the game? Well, for us to talk about it, we must first talk about the realm itself, its significance in Norse mythology, the goddess that rules over it, the monsters that do inhabit it, and finally, the damned that have been cast there. So, it's going to make for a compact and rather interesting ride to say the least. But before we do begin, as always guys, I would super appreciate it if we could get this video to about 500 likes. For those of you who don't know, YouTube has been curbing content creators and how many videos reach your sub boxes as well as the recommended section. So I would super appreciate it if we could simply give this video a thumbs up. And I mean, hey, if you like what we do here and wish to see more, please don't forget to subscribe and of course, tick that bell to stay up to date with what we do here. So with that out the way, let's begin, shall we? Now Helheim is one of many realms born at the dawn of time itself, ushered into existence upon the fall of the greatest giant, Ymir the Primordial. Helheim is unique in every sense of the word, even amongst the other realms. It serves as a somewhat universal underworld, that any and all can fall victim to. Unlike the realms of Asgard, Vanaheim, or even Muspelheim, Helheim is the realm of the damned, where the shunned and forsaken are taken to should they not die in honour. Because of this, Helheim is occupied by many different warriors from many different worlds. But how does one fall into the realm of Helheim? Well, the quickest way to travel there, and it's also the most common, was through death. But even then, you needed to tick a few boxes before you could enter Helheim. You see, in death, you would typically be escorted by a Valkyrie to one of two different places. The first would be the depths of Helheim, and the second would be the halls of Valhalla, a somewhat afterlife utopia based in Asgard. But to get to either of these places, it would actually be determined from how you would die. If you perished with honour, like dying in battle, you would be taken to Asgard and be considered part of Odin's Chosen. However, if you died of cowardness, sickness or even age, I guess it's never too late to go out fighting, you would be dragged to the depths of Helheim. But unlike most depictions of Hell, where it's burning, set on fire and you would be tortured for the sins of your past, Hell was unique in its own way. It was essentially like any other realm. In fact, once you entered Hell, you would start a new life for yourself but one that was undead. So all things considered, Hell wasn't quite as bad as many other Hell-like afterlifes are depicted as. But once you were here, you would be stranded to the likes of Hell for all eternity. There was no escape in death. Now, of course, things would be significantly different with its God of War counterpart. With the absence of the Valkyries, the dead weren't able to ascend to either Valhalla or Hell, meaning that death was considered permanent and a far worse fate, as the dead could not move on. Instead, succumbing to the likes of becoming a Hellwalker. With the guardians of the afterlife gone, the gates of Helheim would be closed and the dead would begin to overflow, spilling into the likes of the world of man and many other realms. It wasn't just Midgard, but was overrun with both Draugr and Hellwalkers. The system of the afterlife was broken, and this was of course done by the hand of Odin. With the realms overrun, chaos would ensue, but this would all come at a cost. With the Valkyries now gone, the death of Baldur, Magni and Modi would actually be permanent ones, as they could never ascend to the likes of Valhalla or even Hell. But outside of its broken system, what else about Helheim is unique? Well, the terrain is something that's very, very interesting. It is in a way, a character in itself, 
as the realm of Hilheim is known for being infamously very, very cold. And when I say cold, I mean that it's freezing to the point that not even someone with godhood could survive down there for too long. Very few have walked through that world and come out alive. But what of the beasts that lie in Hilheim? Well, in the God of War universe, we meet three different unique enemy types. A giant bird, a valkyrie, and a troll. So, first off, let's actually talk about the giant bird as I think many believe this to actually be Hell, the goddess of death. But unfortunately, you would be wrong in believing that, as the giant bird is called Hres Velga. Along with this, he actually does not derive from Helheim, as he is in fact a giant. Yes, one of the very few giants to have escaped the jaws of fate. Whilst he doesn't bear the typical appearance of his Jotun brothers, do not be fooled as much like Jormungandr and Fenrir, he is most certainly one of them. Now, the giant actually remains in the realm of hell because he's actually important to its ecosystem. Those chilling winds that I had mentioned earlier, in fact, resonate from him as he stands at the peak of Helheim on what's called the world's end. The Yotno would flap his wings to cast gusts of cold wind all across Helheim. He is one of hell's natural guardians having it so none that are unwelcome trespass into the likes of the afterlife. Our next unique beast is Rotar, a fallen Valkyrie of Asgard. Shortly following Odin's descent into madness and the exile of the Vanir goddess Freya, the Valkyries of Valhalla would be cursed to mortal forms, something that is widely unheard of because Valkyries themselves retain spiritual ones being confined to bodies made of bone and flesh, in fact caused the Valkyries to go insane, attacking anything on sight or anyone that dare provoke their attention. Seeing what her guardians were becoming, their new appointed Valkyrie queen, Sigrun, was forced to incarcerate her sisters to the depths of different realms, hoping that by doing so, she could restrain them, keep them away from doing harm. But in time, she knew that even she would succumb to the very same fate. So, with her sisters locked away, she would finally seal herself, hoping that no god or man would ever find her or those that followed her. But of course, as we are aware, the Valkyries would not remain this way, as Rota would be found by Atreus and Kratos, the two on a pursuit and quest to save the Valkyries from themselves, restoring the balance of life and death. But this was no simple task, as a lot of time had passed by since their corruption. Thus, the Valkyries go out to fix the mess that Odin had created. Our final and unique beast here is a troll known by the name of Matadgur Helsen, aka the Bridge Keeper. Now, it's not currently known if the troll actually originated from Hell, but unlike the other trolls that we do battle with in game, the Bridge Keeper is unique in terms of both combat and design. For one, he is seemingly immune to the cold winds of Hell, and two, he actively uses the winds of Hell mechanic as a way to battle his opponent. This enables him to teleport around the arena, imbue his totem with ice, and cast spheres from it that explode on contact. Now, of course, this is clearly not enough to stop the likes of Kratos, as he does take his heart, but he's still worth mentioning here, as he's pivotal to the plot, and there is no troll in the entire game that acts like him. Very little is known about the origins of where trolls come from, as they are spread far throughout the lands and realms, so we can't really pinpoint whether or not the bridge keeper was born here or taken here from somewhere else at a very young age. I don't believe believe he's as simple minded as he looks. Now finally, of course, we can talk about the ruler of death's domain, Hell, the goddess of death. In Norse mythology, the goddess is one of three children spawned from Loki, the god of mischief, and the giantess, Angraboda. Her brothers are Jormungandr, the world serpent, and the giant wolf, Fenrir. Now, do not be fooled by her design, as whilst Angraboda had given birth to beasts, and she was human on the surface, this was simply only on one side. Hell had unique properties and design of being both alive and dead. 
as the other side of her was a decaying corpse. She's a unique being that is both alive and dead, sharing the duality of both sides in one godly form. Unfortunately, in time, the misdeeds of Loki would catch the attention of the All Father Odin. Having seen his son plant the seeds of fate, wanting Ragnarok to blossom, Odin would immobilize such a prophecy from ever coming to fruition, with Jormungandr being tossed into Midgard's ocean, Fenrir being imprisoned to the kennels of Asgard, and Hel being exiled to the depths of Helheim. Here, she would be given the right to rule the realm. But of course, this was in exchange for her freedom. If you think about it, Odin, in a way, is actually responsible for forging these children into the beasts that would destroy Asgard. As shortly following the death of Balder, and her denying any chance of his return, the death bell would toll, and Ragnarok would begin, with Hel sending forth her army of the dead to tear down Odin's Asgardian army. As Serta and her brother laid siege to Asgard, the kingdom would slowly break and crumble. Many gods and monsters fell, and after a hard-fought battle with her brothers slain, Odin and Thor were dead. The death of these two marks an end to the battle, with Hel being one of the very few to have survived the battle. Now, depending on which interpretation of Ragnarok you're familiar with, the cycle either continues, with the world being born anew, or that the world carries on, with man now inheriting the world. Thus, the age of gods is at an end, and the descendants of the gods is what allows the world to continue on. But once again, we are at the crossroad of, does this reflect in the world of God of War? Well, honestly, it's not entirely clear. Because unlike her brothers, Fenrir and Jormungandr, she is yet to be referred to or referenced to by name. Plus, Hel doesn't actually need her to be around for Helheim to function. It was around long before she was there. But we must also keep in mind the possible likelihood that she is there when the cycle turned, as both the World Serpent and Giant Wolf are both prominent and alive in the 2018 game. We simply don't know right now, but with her playing a role in the siege against Asgard, and God of War Ragnarok being the climax of the Norse series, I don't believe it's a matter of if, but when we eventually see her. But for now, this has been it for me. I hope you have enjoyed this video guys, and most importantly, learned more by doing so. This has been a fairly dense and compact episode, so I think there's a lot to learn from this. And with Ragnarok seemingly around the corner, please give me a release date, please give me a release date, I believe it's pivotal to know all of Loki's children and what role they will play in the final battle. Plus, with the tease of Kratos' possible demise, you never know what the future may hold for the Spartan, as he may fall into the likes of Helheim and be assisted out of it by his granddaughter, which is a fun little twist on the Boulder tale. It is something we must pay close attention to. But for now, this wraps up everything here guys. So as always, stay strong, stay well, and keep on fighting as Ragnarok comes for us all. Take care everyone, see you soon.